I specialized, uh, Mercy Hospital many years ago here in Miami had an HIV unit, and I specialized in HIV for quite some time. Um, I've done hospice, which interestingly enough is probably one of my favorite um, aspects of nursing. Um, I've been an instructor, I've done travel nursing, and I've also worked as a legal nurse consultant, so I have a little bit of a legal background as well. Um, I've worked both here on the East Coast and on the West Coast, um, which has given me a chance to see how medicine uh, works in different parts of the country. Um, out of California, I had worked at UC Davis, one of the top um, institutions that they have out there. Um, here on the East Coast, I've worked at Yale. Um, that's where I did the uh, adult trauma. I've worked in Jersey, Georgia, and here. So I've kind of been around the country. to you will be um, sharing with you different scenarios. So as I mentioned, I'm going to be sharing different scenarios uh -huh. to consider when accommodating an adherent or clergy of the Lukumi religion, Palo Mayombe and Spiritism. One of the main things that we're trying to accomplish, as we mentioned earlier through this workshop, is not only meeting the physical needs of the clients and or patients, but also to ensure cultural communication as has been the, the common thread of communication for today. Okay, so the first scenario is going to be someone coming into the adult trauma center. Um, this person is an adherent of our religion. It's a, a conscious female who arrives via the first responders, and she comes in with a non-lethal gunshot wound to the shoulder. So it's not life-threatening, it's not a life-threatening situation. So one of the first things that the healthcare worker, be it a nurse, um, the CNA, the nursing assistant, the tech, one of the first things that um, they're gonna do is assess the patient, and in doing so, you're gonna see that they have a beaded necklace and that hangs to their mid chest and a beaded bracelet on the left hand, okay? Or wrist, I should say. Knowing that this is a particular scenario where she requires numerous images, meaning x-rays, possibly CAT scans, MRIs, <coughs> um, you instruct the patient on the need to temporarily remove, um, specifically the, the necklace. Okay, because again, we're looking at the fact that it's a wound to the shoulder and the necklace may possibly be in the way. In the ideal situation, you allow for the patient, if possible, to remove it themselves. And when I say if possible, again, in this case, the patient is conscious. Later on, we'll talk about other scenarios. Um, if for whatever reason the patient herself cannot remove it, you have a family member remove the, the necklace. If all options are exhausted, she can't remove it, the family member can't remove it, um, we will have then one of the, um, the healthcare providers remove the item. The main thing to remember though is that these items are consecrated, okay? They are consecrated religious items and not jewelry. It is our belief that any um, impurities of a lay person can contaminate the religious items, which is one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, I should say, why we would prefer for a non-adherent not to handle any of our consecrated items. And then again, just you know, explaining that um, this is why it is so important for us to wear it, because it's something that's consecrated and we use for protection. Everybody following this so far? All right, scenario number two. Again, we're in the ER. 
we have someone come in with an ankle injury. This is a, a young man, let's say, that was playing basketball, and he injured his right ankle. During the assessment, it is noticed that he's wearing a beaded necklace, and again, he's wearing his ID, um, a bracelet to his left wrist. Since neither one of these two items interfere with the fact that um, we're going to be doing x-rays, again, possible CAT scans and or MRIs, to the ankle, we totally allow the person to leave it on, uh, handle it respectfully, of course, um, and there's no need to ask them to remove it. Okay, so again, we're just trying to teach the healthcare worker where to be sensitive to, um, to our needs. Now this time we're gonna have the same scenario. Gentleman playing basketball hits his, uh, hurts his ankle rather, but this time um, we notice that he has uh, an ankle chain to his left ankle. Okay, um, one of the things that we're going to do is inquire with the patient if it is a religious item or if it's jewelry. We can never assume, as healthcare providers, we can't just assume, well, this is such and such, and, and bypass it and just continue with our work. Um, sometimes we tend to be very focused and we could do that, but that, that's not what we want to do. Um, in communicating with the patient, he tells you that it, it is a, a religious item. So you tell them that it may be necessary for them to temporarily remove the anklet uh, while any type of care is completed. Um, but again, one of the things that we do, we ask, communicate with them, acknowledge any type of, of consecrated item on them, and then proceed accordingly. If it's going to be in the way, you ask them to remove it. If it's not, then you just let, let it be. Our third scenario is in the OR prep area. For anyone who's ever had any type of procedure or surgery, they prep you beforehand. Um, in doing an assessment as part of the OR prep, you notice the patient wearing beaded necklaces and a bracelet to the left wrist. Um, I'll share a quick story with you in a minute. I had this scenario not so long ago. Um, each facility, each hospital has their own protocol regarding um, handling jewelry. So, um, in this particular scenario, per hospital protocol, per, per uh, facility protocol, you ask them to remove all the jewelry. They state they will remove all the items except the beaded bracelets to the left wrist. This is exactly what happened to me. I was getting ready for my surgery. Um, I didn't have my necklaces because I knew, but I did have my idea orula on. Um, the patient further explains that there's no metal, copper, gold, etc. in the bracelet and it's beaded with string. So again, in being sensitive to the adherent, you have already gained IV access to the right hand of this patient. Remember, we're speaking about the left. So you have the IV here. You explain to the patient that you will be securing their left wrist. However, if an em the bracelet, I should say, to the left wrist. If an emergency arises, you may need to remove it temporarily. But otherwise, um, you do have to respectfully allow for them to keep it on. And the nurse at first, when I told her, this is, this is exactly what I said, I said, I'll remove everything except this bracelet. And um, she kind of hesitated and looked at me and I said to her, it is a religious bracelet. And that was the end of the conversation. She knew, she was you know, knowledgeable, and, um, and I was allowed to wear it, never had any issues, came out of anesthesia and everything was fine, my bracelet was on and I was happy. Um, but again, you always want to communicate with the, the patient and just let them know, it, offer them an explanation um, as to why it needs to be removed. I'll point this way. Oh, <laughs> this way. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, it's not going to go through my brain. <laughs> There's no connection to me. She all right, we have scenario number four, which is the hospice scenario as I mentioned to you earlier. It's one of my, interestingly enough, one of my favorite um, aspects of nursing. Um, in this case, you are caring for a patient with end-stage liver disease. 
the patient is a DNR, do not resuscitate, meaning that no heroic measures, CPR, none of that is going to be done. In hospice, that's usually um, a criteria that you need to meet in order to be eligible for hospice. Um, there will be no IV or other life-sustaining measures to be taken. The family requests to apply a white handkerchief to the patient's head, uh, apply religious necklaces and bracelets. You comply as doing so would be respecting the patient's beliefs. Again, being um, sensitive to the patient's religious belief, their culture, you adhere to what's best for them. Um, in working in hospice, too, I, I'll just share with you very quickly that I've had scenarios where um, end stage, it's, it's very emotional, needless to say, and uh, you'll have perhaps a family member in the room of an adherent of the Lukumi religion ask, should they get a Catholic priest? Okay. You know, and then you just kind of pause and you just kind of let them speak among themselves and, and figure it out. But with me, I mean, I've gone to my purse and have offered uh, cascarilla, and you know, I said, look, you know, do you know who to call and, and whatnot. But again, just being culturally sensitive and um, respectful of, of their religious beliefs. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, a scenario where you're going to um, a facility to have some lab drawn, uh, or blood drawn, I should say. You have a lab tech. Uh, assess the potential for IV sites and initiates access on the right hand, but it fails. So they went ahead to try to put in an IV, rather, um, to the right hand, and they've tried twice and they haven't had any success. So now they're going to go ahead and try over on the left hand, but they notice that the person has a beaded bracelet on the left hand. Again, inquire with the patient if it is a religious bracelet. The patient states that it is a religious bracelet, however, <coughs> they, will, they, will be, they will need to remove it temporarily, excuse me, while the IV access is obtained. The main thing is, as I, I'll keep stressing, the communication. You let them know that it's temporarily, you let them know as to the reason why. The last thing that you would want to do is um, make them feel uncomfortable or make them feel that one is being discriminatory, whereas, well, you need to take that off because I need to do my job. No, that, that's not, you know, again, being culturally sensitive and, and respectful. Um, let's see here. All right, so lab tech assures the patient that once the IV access is obtained, they may reapply, reapply the bracelet. Um, <coughs> now, being fully informed, it puts the patient at ease, and they comply without any type of difficulty. Um, the last thing you would want to do, again, as I mentioned, make the patient feel uncomfortable or seem confrontational. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not our goal here. Our goal is, again, just to make sure that they know why we need to do this, how it's going to be done, and that their consecrated items are going to be treated with respect. So in summary, um, if you just I, uh, remember these four steps, it'll be just very easy to know how to accommodate someone um, of our religion or any other uh, religion who has consecrated items um, with them. You identify, inquire if the items are religious or and or consecrated items. You assess, can the patient remove their religious items him or by him or herself? You inform them, communication. Uh, instruct the patient of the need to temporarily remove the religious items and you assure them. Communicating with the patient puts them at ease and assists with compliance. Again, that's what you always want is for the patient to feel comfortable and for them to comply with you without any confrontation, without any uh, miscommunication or, or any other uh, negativity, let's say. That's the end of my presentation. And I will pass it over to Jose. Is it Jose? Yes. Let's give us